All right. We are in uh, the book of Luke today. Beautiful New Testament book in the Bible. Considered one of the Gospels, the great Gospels. But they're all great, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. They're all great Gospels. Luke has some things that some of the other Gospels don't include. And... Um, not because they're wrong or right, just because it has a little more information. Some have one thing, some have other, and they're all unanimous in proclaiming Jesus Christ as the Savior of the world. Today, we are in chapter 16 of Luke, and we have some interesting parables about Hades. There was... Um, is two compartments in the spiritual realm in the center of the earth. One is that of torment, the other is considered paradise. Jesus uh, talked about them during his time on earth. After his resurrection, it does appear that the Place in the center of the earth that was considered paradise um, was emptied out. Uh, very possibly, there is a, a, a reaping of the center of the earth, the paradise, uh, and then after that reaping, then their man continued to enjoy that place until the, the rapture of the church. Because at the rapture of the church, um, the Bible does seem to declare that those um, that had died before that time period were caught up into the air with them. And yet, somehow they're able to have access to the presence of the Lord also. Um, we see that. Um, Paul says to be dead from the body is to be present with the Lord. So a lot of that we don't totally understand um, but it's okay. Um, just understand, when you leave this body as a Christian, you will be in the presence of the Lord, whether, whether it's in paradise or in the heavens or, or in the uh, uh, second and third heavens in that realm. Uh, it's okay, because we're going to be with him. And uh, in either case, um, I think our time on this earth is drawing to a close, either way. And uh, what matters is that we are faithful to him, whatever your beliefs are, that you are faithful to Christ and to be ready. And when he comes, we will not be ashamed and we'll be ready to go. I know I'm ready to go. And uh, if he wants me to stay here and give out the word and uh, help out my little kitties uh, struggle on this life, that's fine. Uh, but if he calls me home, then, then he does. And uh, praise the Lord. Um, but until that time, I'm here to serve and to minister as he would have me to be... Uh, um, undercover, uh, factory worker, uh, representing the Word of God in the workplace, uh, father, bodybuilder, and lay Bible teacher. Okay, enough of that. And let's get on with our Bible study here. And he said also unto his disciples, There was a certain rich man which had a steward, and the same was accused unto him, that he had wasted his goods. He called him and said unto him, How is it that I hear this of thee? Give an account of thy stewardship, for thou mayest no longer be the steward. Then the steward said within himself, What shall I do? For my Lord taketh away from me the stewardship. I cannot dig to beg. I am ashamed. I am resolved what to do, that when I am put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their homes. So he called every one of his Lord's debtors unto him and said unto the first, How much owest thou unto my Lord? And he said, An hundred measures of oil. And he said unto him, Take thy bill, sit down quickly, and write fifty. Then said he to another, And how much owest thou? He said, An hundred measures of wheat. He said unto him, Take thy bill, and write fourscore. The Lord commended the unjust steward, because he had done wisely. 
For the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. And I say unto you, make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness, that when ye fail, they may receive you into everlasting habitations. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. If therefore you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? Let me sum up that little parable unto you. The Lord makes a representation of a worldly man who dealt wisely. He was found probably in the wrong, and yet he shifts and tries to make amends quickly, not only for his master's sake, but also those that owe his master money so that he may gain favor. Then the Lord says to make friends with yourselves. How do you, how do, you do that? How do you make yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness? I'll tell you how. You support the ministry of the word of God out there in the world. Local pastors, uh, Christian radio programming, um, teachers. Um, you support them. That's how you support them, by the means of unrighteous mammon. And when it fails, you will inherit your eternal realm in Jesus Christ. Because you've made an effort as a Christian and follower of Christ to take some of the money that you have, and give to those that are proliferating the word of God into the world. Sometimes it's to give that money to a poor man. When you give to a poor man who's starving and hungry, or a woman or family or whatever, if you give to the poor, the Lord says, you're giving unto him. If you give so much as a cold drink of water to one of the Lord's little children, it's like giving it to him. And that's how we make friends by the mammon of unrighteousness. Where we take what God has given us and spread it around. All right, let's move along here. Verse 13. No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Now, he just got done saying, take some of what you have and spread it around. Then he goes on to say, and this is why, many people that have the money, they sit on it like a goose on a golden egg, and they don't want to give it up. The rich want to hang on to everything they've got, and they're the most stingy. Don't be that way, because you can't serve God and your riches. You can only worship one thing. Once you start piling away nest eggs, you start to depend on that nest egg as your savior rather than God. Because Christ must be your strong tower, regardless of your rich or poor. And not monies, but Christ. So you can't serve God and mammon. The Pharisees also who were covetous heard all these things and they derided him or they mocked, they laughed. He said unto them, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men. But God knoweth your hearts, for that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time the kingdom of God is preached, and every man presseth into it. And it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than one tittle of the law to fail. Whosoever putteth away his wife and marrieth another committeth adultery, and whosoever marrieth her that is put away from her husband committeth adultery. Now why it's interesting. Why did Jesus bring that up? Well, I'll tell you why. Because marriage and divorce and marriage and divorce and marriage and divorce and marriage and divorce at will will and at whim was highly practiced amongst the Pharisees and Sadducees, and they made every possible excuse in which to do so. But Jesus made it very clear. 
and the New Testament. And we'll find that later on when we get into the um, little minor epistles and so forth. That there's only one reason for um, divorce and separating and moving on into your marriage, and that's adultery, unfaithfulness, where one or the others uh, in a marriage uh, relationship between man and woman, they are unfaithful to their spouse. Um, they commit adultery. They, they go to bed with others other than their spouse. And that is grounds for biblical divorce, and you are free to marry, but only in the Lord. And if you are a Christian, you should only be marrying another born-again Christian that loves Jesus like you do. If you marry a non-believer, you are going against the will of God. That's just the way it is. Um, the only other um, option in a marriage relationship where one is a Christian and one is not is you have two non-believers. Uh, one of them gets saved um, and is serving the Lord and uh, the other one doesn't want to go down that road and that uh, non-believer leaves. Um, the Christian is allowed to remarry in that situation and the non-believer, if they choose to leave, um, they are free to go and that... Uh, Believer is uh, free also to be remarried, but only in Christ. You can only marry a believer. You cannot redo the same wrong. Okay, you have to move on in your life and practice obedience. Uh, if the non-believer chooses to stay in the marriage, he is also uh, welcome to stay. The Bible will sanctify the children um, and keep that home a home where the Spirit of God dwells, even though there is a non-believer in the marriage, as long as that person is happy to live in that uh, situation. All right, that's a little side note um, from our text, but uh, let's move along here. Verse 19. Now we're going to talk a little bit about that place in the center of the earth. Two places. Um, one is Hades, one is uh, the paradise, and they're both in the center of the earth in the spiritual realm somehow. We don't really know, but somehow... Uh, it is there. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores. And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, moreover dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. So death comes to everybody, you know. Unless you make it to the rapture of the church, death is going to come to everybody. The rich, the poor, and the Christian and non-Christian. You know, we, uh, for the Christian, it's called uh, being asleep. And for the uh, non-Christian, it's called death. You know, a little bit more brutal. Because it is brutal. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torment, that is the rich man, seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bo bosom. They're hugging, they're having fellowship. And you can see Abraham down there in the Old Testament saints in the area and the region that's called paradise by Jesus. And he cried and he said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receiveth thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot Neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Now that's pretty noble of him, actually. He's in hell. And he wants um, somebody from the grave to go to his brethren so they don't wind up in hell with him. It's actually commendable, but there's at that point it's irrelevant whether it's commendable or not. You have your eternal destiny is is secured, and not in a good way. 
Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. In other words, you got the word of God. If you won't listen to the word of God, you're not going to listen to geisters. Okay? You're just not going to listen. Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. But he said, Nay, Father. Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent of their sins. Abraham says, No. He said unto them, If they don't hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded if one rose from the dead. And I would say that's a truth when difficult times happen. Here in our country, we had our 9-11, and for a very short time, people were somewhat contrite and repentant. Um, but you know what? They, that blew away, and they're back to their normal deeds. We have the, you know, the happy guys in the poodle club, Moving on, marrying uh, same gender marriages. We see the drunkenness and, you know, taking the Bible out of the public workplace. And Christianity is getting, you know, smeared out of the public sector. And uh, it didn't last long. You know, like if there's a funeral or a death, you see people are a little bit moved and a little bit, maybe I should stop the sinning and move with Jesus, you know. Uh, and then they leave the funeral and then they're back to their old life. If you won't hear the word of God, you're not going to hear somebody from the dead. You're not going to listen to a geister floating around telling you, better listen up because you're going to come to hell. If you won't listen to the word of God, you won't listen to anything. So my friend, listen to the word of God. Spend time in your day. Open it up. Listen to it. If you have sin in your life, repent of it. Stop it. Move on in your life. Move on to joyful things that will last forever. God bless you, friends, from the Bears Gym. Hope you've enjoyed. See you next time.